We are living in a day in which Bible prophecy is being fulfilled in warp speed. Daniel says, in the last days, knowledge will increase and men will run to and fro. We certainly see this happening everywhere we look today. In Luke 21, it says, and there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and on the earth, distress of nations and perplexity. Can you think of a more appropriate label for the pandemic than the word perplexity? A state of confusion and uncertainty, a tangled, involved and confused condition. The Bible also says, for a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Everywhere we turn, we see Bible prophecy fulfilled right before our eyes, and yet it seems like no one's talking about it. Where are the prophetic voices in the church today? Where are the watchmen on the wall? Where are the voices crying out aloud in the streets, calling people to repentance before the great and dreadful day of the Lord? It's time for the church to lift up its voice. It's time for us to sound the alarm. It's time for the church to return to the message of the second coming of Jesus. It's time to talk about the rapture. It's time to warn people of the days of distress and great tribulation that are coming upon the earth after the rapture of the church. We believe it's time to preach, once again, the timeless message that Jesus is coming soon. It's time to preach the message of yesterday, again today. Let's get back to the future, again. All right, I want you to grab your Bible this morning, and I want you to go to Revelation chapter 6. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 6 today. Uh, we're in our series. Uh, we're calling it Back to the Future again. We're releasing our middle school students. Pastor Paul is going to be, Pastor Paul, he just got promoted. Pa Paul's going to be teaching the middle schoolers, and uh, they're going to be learning the same thing that we're learning. And we're kind of having a little bit of fun with this. This is a very serious series. Can you say man? I mean, very serious time of teaching, but we're having a little bit of fun at the same time. Did ever, has everybody spotted my hoverboard over here? Somebody said, well, Pastor Coase, what is that skateboard doing? And it's not a skateboard, it's a hoverboard. It's how I get to church. I don't know if you realize that, but I just float right in. And we've got to be careful we don't go over 88 miles an hour and you're here in the sanctuary because we know what happens. And anyway, we're having a little bit of fun with this. We've actually got a picture, it's not this one, but we've actually got a picture of me driving the DeLorean. It, it, it's an amazing picture. We'll show you that some other time. But uh, Revelation chapter 6, I want you to go there and... Uh, we're preaching the message yesterday, again today. I love that theme. We're getting back to preaching the message of the second coming. We're going to pick right up where we left off from last week. Revelation chapter 6, we started this chapter last week. And do you remember we made it through how many verses? We made it through two verses. I've got new good news for you today. We're only going to make it through two verses. <laughs> and it may be a while before we get through much further than this. Now, in the future, no doubt, we'll cover more verses at one time, maybe whole chapters. But right now, there's too much material. There's just too much to cover because chapter 6 is the breaking of the seven sealed book. You remember in heaven there was this book that was found on the right hand of the one sitting on the throne and they looked all over. They looked in heaven, they looked on earth, they looked under the earth and they couldn't find anybody that could open that book. The problem was they didn't look in the right place because he was there all along but he was sitting on the throne. And finally they gave that book to Jesus and if you remember he said in words, I am the kinsman redeemer. I am the one that has the resources and I'm a near kinsman because I'm touched with the feelings of your infirmities. I'm human just like you are human. He's our kinsman redeemer just like Boaz was to Ruth. He has the ability to restore everything that was taken from us and return to us our inheritance. And so Jesus begins to open this seven sealed book. The seven sealed book is the mortgage deed of redemption. Remember that? It's the book that contains the terms of what's necessary for man to get his inheritance back. How many want everything that's yours? Can I see your hand? You're not selfish about it. You're just sincere because you want to have influence, you want to have anointing. Man's inheritance was prophesied in Genesis 1. And God blessed man and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. Those five things were given to mankind as is inheritance. But what happened? That inheritance was lost. Because of sin, God took 
those five original positive commandments and they had to be mortgaged because man's inheritance became into a mortgage condition and the five commandments that were positive became ten commandments that were negative. Thou shalt not. And I think it's amazing how that sin took five thou shalt and turned them into thou shalt nots and ten of them doubled them and then religion came along and I love this I, I can't linger on it right now but religion took the ten commandments and turned them into six, 613 rules and regulations you ever wonder how many laws how many rules how many regulations how many strictures were in the Old Testament 613 because mankind can never do enough he can never stop doing enough he can never earn his place in the kingdom so Jesus begins to open the seals of this book and last week we opened seal number one we found that the first seal was opened by the rider on the white horse there are four horsemen of the apocalypse and these will be our structures for the next three weeks after today number one yes yes last week was the the white horse and then today we're going to talk about the red horse then the third horseman is the black horse and the fourth is the pale horse the white horse yes last week I keep saying yesterday last week the rider on the white horse is the one who will later be revealed as the Antichrist how many remember all this if you weren't here with us last week you can get all the messages and get caught up on our YouTube uh, channel but if you remember Antichrist is the Antichrist the word anti means two things it means against and it means instead of and he will be both he will be the against Christ he will oppose and exalt himself against against everything that is called God or worship, and he will be the instead of Christ. He will set himself on God's throne, proclaiming that he is God. So the Antichrist is revealed right after the rapture. The first seal that's opened after mankind is taken up into heaven in Revelation 4.1 and in chapter 4 and chapter 5, we were worshiping before the throne. Remember that? For the last couple of weeks, just like we were singing here this morning, holy, 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 the four and twenty elders take their crowns and they cast them before the throne of the Lamb and they say worthy are you O Lord and God to receive power and might and glory and honor and praise and they honored him well now Jesus begins to open the seals and the first seal releases the first horseman which is a white horse and he is the picture of Antichrist now, before we go any further, there's a couple of objections I always cover. Uh, some people say, but pastor, he's on a white horse. How could he be the Antichrist? How many of Satan always comes disguised as an angel of light? He is always a wolf dressed in sheep's clothing, but he's wearing a crown. Well, yes, technically a crown, but it was a Stephanos, the victor's crown, not the diadem, which is of royalty or dignity. But it says in that verse, it was given to him to wear. In other words, God said, here you go, son. <laughs> Even though you think you're all that in the bag of chips, I'm going to just give you a crown and you're going to wear it and you're going to strut around thinking you're really something. But in all reality, I'm just allowing you to do that to fulfill my purpose and my destiny on the earth. How many of God is still in charge? I'm going to tell you what, God never vacates the throne. Even in the days of the tribulation, even in the time of great distress among the nations, such as never been anything comparable to it, God is still orchestrating the circumstances circumstances of human events to fulfill his divine destiny for the nation of Israel. So today we get to chapter 6 verse 3 and we're going to open the second seal. Okay, this is the second seal, the second horseman of the four of the apocalypse. Well, verse 3, and he opened the second seal and I heard the second living creature say, come. Now I want to remind you that invitation to come, it's not given to John. He's not saying John come because John is already there. The invitation is given to the rider of the horseman. In other words, the first one, he said, come and Antichrist came. So in the second one, in verse 3, he says, come. And so the second horse comes, a bright red horse. And its rider, listen to this carefully, was permitted to take peace from the earth. It was permitted. Everybody say permitted. To take peace from the earth. So that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. So this second horse, this second seal, the red horse, is the one that is permitted to take peace, to remove peace, to withdraw peace from the earth. 
so that they slay one another, so that people become violent towards one another, so that there is a culture now that is released in the great tribulation of conflict and violence and, and, and war. And we'll go ahead and we'll name this second rider, the second horseman on the red horse is the horseman of war. And the scripture says he is permitted to take peace from the earth. Now, i got three or four points for you, and I just uploaded things on the YouVersion Bible app. I didn't get it up as early as I should have this morning. It takes a while for the um, network to populate it. So if anybody's checked, there should be notes available for you by now. And if anybody's seeing that, give me a wave, and we'll let everybody know it's not, it's not there yet. Okay, so give it a few more minutes, and it's, you check it about halfway through the service. In a couple of hours, halfway through the service, check it, and it might be there. So anyway, <laughs> it just went right over somebody's head. i got three or four points for you. Here's number one. In order to take peace, there must be peace. I know this is deep, but I, I, I hope you can comprehend it. In order to take, I'm looking for a victim. <laughs> In order to take a million dollars from Butch, he has to have a million dollars. You can't take what's not there. You can't steal what someone doesn't possess. So when it says that this second horseman on the red horse takes peace from the earth, there has to be peace on earth before he can take peace from the earth. Now, what's that tell us? That tells us that's not possible today because neither today nor any other time in human history since the creation of mankind after the fall in the garden has there been peace on earth. In fact, we know that there will never be peace on earth until Jesus comes. He is the Prince of Peace. I love to teach that on Christmas, that his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. There will never be peace on earth, permanent, lasting peace, until Jesus comes. There will never be peace in the Middle East. I don't care how many treaties they sign. I don't care how many agreements they agree to. I don't care how many books they write. I don't care how many speeches they make. There will never be peace on earth until Jesus comes and establishes permanent, lasting peace. But this verse says, that the person that is called the war uh, picture of this horseman, he will come when there is apparent peace. I want you to get a hold of this. What's that telling us is that the arrival of the Antichrist from last week would have been highly successful. He would have been highly successful in his attempts to get the attention of the whole world and solve all the world's problems. Now, I really believe that last week when we opened that first seal, that's a process. It's not just a seal that's popped open in a few minutes. That first seal is open over the course of three and a half years or so. The Antichrist is coming on the scene. He's gaining popularity. He's gaining notoriety. He's getting more and more influence. He's getting more and more support. And his kingdom is, is gaining ground. More and more people are trying to recognize him as, boy, this guy has really got all the answers. This guy is solving the pandemic. This guy is solving the racial conflicts of our world. This guy, man, he's amazing. This guy is wonderful. And for three and a half years, he will look to be the savior of the world. But I remind you he is not the savior he's the anti-savior he's not the christ he's the anti-christ he's not god he's the instead of god but he will apparently establish a lot on the earth that everybody thinks is is wonderful it appears to be everybody say appear it appears to be peace on earth but first thessalonians 5 says while people are saying peace and safety then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. The rider on the white horse will take this short-lived pseudo-peace, and he'll take it from the earth. When this rider is released, the world then will be plunged into turmoil. The day of Jacob's trouble will be launched into full motion. The first seal, the first uh, uh, week of the rise of the Antichrist will be fulfilled and now we'll be into the second half of the three of the seven years, the final three and a half years, which will be full of great turmoil, great uh, war, great culture of, of violence and adversity. And that covers a whole whole portion of revelation like revelation chapter 6 through verse 9 through chapter 19 the six seals the first seal only takes two verses last week we only took two verses and we we opened the first seal that was the first three and a half years 
But now, the next three and a half years, and this is portrayed by the trumpets and the bowls and, and uh, all of those uh, visual word pictures all the way through the rest of the book of Revelation. But that's the picture of this season of war. This time of conflict, it's described in great detail. But the Antichrist, who came on the scene on a white horse, he apparently looked like a good guy, and he looked like he was bringing world peace. Now, all of a sudden, everything has changed. The horse is no longer white. He's no longer the peacemaker. He's one unleashing a great season of war and devastation and violence on the planet. Now, let me go to the next point. That is, this season of war, it's not a surprise. It, it shouldn't be something that we are shocked about because it was predicted by Jesus. Now, let me say before I go on, we're not going to be here. If you are a Christian, if you have Jesus Christ in your life, you're saved, and uh, your life is, is redeemed by the blood of Jesus, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, you're raptured. You can go back a couple of weeks ago and listen to that. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. And for two whole chapters, chapter 4 and chapter 5, our attention was what was going on in heaven. We were worshiping around the throne of God. We were singing, holy, holy, holy. But now, back to chapter 6, our attention turns back to the earth. Not that we're on the earth at this time. But in the revelation, we're seeing the picture of what is happening on the earth at this time. And we're still in the presence of the Lord. But Jesus said this in Matthew 24. See that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I'm the Christ, and will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. I've always thought that that term, rumors of war was a wonderful way that a Bible writer in an ancient world that had never heard the word terrorist, never knew what a terrorist was, never conceived of modern terroristic warfare, and he's trying to describe it. And so he says, wow, this is like rumors of war. This is like worries and anxieties and, and threats and, and uh, discussions and, and conversations. And, and, and everybody's worried, and is it, is it going to happen? And am I going to live in, in this term? It's a rumor of war. And Jesus said, this is to be expected. And I want to give you a couple things on this. Not every war during this time of a season of war on the earth will be a traditional kind of war. It will not always be nation against nation. It will not always be army against army. It will not always be this nation's army against that nation's army. Because Jesus went on to say, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be physical wars, but there will be spiritual wars. There will be wars of ideologies. There will be wars of philosophies. There will be wars of mindsets. There will be wars of worldviews. There will be wars of preconceived ideas. I want to tell you right now, if you don't realize it yet, there is a war among all wars going on in the United States of America right now. It's a war of a mindset. It's the war of a worldview. There is an evil, demonic worldview, and there's a righteous, godly worldview for the founding of our nation. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm just going to go ahead and put my stake in the sand on this hilltop. I believe that America was raised up by... God to be a beacon to the rest of the world so that God would bless America and give us resources and finances and bless us so that we can take the wealth of the wicked and use it to preach the gospel all over the world. I know America is not a perfect nation. Come on, somebody. I know we've still got some problems we got to deal with. I know that there are still racial issues. I know that there are still ideological problems. I know that there's still a lot of cultural things that need to be taken care of. And by the help and the grace of God, as Christians, we need to be a part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Come on, somebody. But I don't think that America is the blight of the world. Come on, somebody. I don't think God would have blessed America this much to just see us go down the tubes as a hopeless nation that is irreconcilable to the kingdom of God. I think God can still bless America. If we get on our knees, instead of singing God bless America, America starts blessing God and living our lives according to the principles of God's word. We can believe that God can still have his plans and his purposes fulfilled in this nation. Nation. But there's a whole different philosophy out there. There's a whole different mindset out there. There's a whole different worldview. And right now it's a conflict 
of the kingdoms. It's dark versus light. It's Christian versus humanism and secularism and every other time of ism that's out there. And not every war is a traditional war. Secondly, this prophecy, wars and rumors of war, I want to say this in integrity for teaching, it's not particularly technically a prophecy about the rapture. Now, I know that nearly every preacher has preached that Jesus is coming soon. The rapture is at hand because the Bible says wars and rumors of war. And that's true in a bigger picture. But the wars and the rumors of war prediction that Jesus made is not really to what's going to be going on the earth leading up to the rapture as much as it is what's going to be happening immediately after the rapture. It's okay to still use that as an encouragement for people to get right with God because if that's what it's going to be immediately after the rapture and we're already seeing the climate like that now before the rapture, what's that tell us? We're closer to that time than what we can ever possibly imagine. But when Jesus said there's wars and rumors of war, he was talking about that's what the culture is going to be like for the world right after the rapture when this second horseman of the apocalypse on the red horse is going to take peace from the earth. Then also, this is important, the end of the age that Jesus speaks about here, the end, he said, this, don't be alarmed, this must happen, but the end is not yet. The end there is not the rapture. The end there is not going to happen until, well, technically, I taught you this last week, a thousand and seven years after the rapture. But he says there will be this terrible season. There will be this culture of violence. Peace will be taken from the earth. I don't even have time this morning to talk about how that's going to be possible. But part of that will be possible because the righteous influence of the church, the body of Christ, will no longer be on the earth. That's what Paul says to the Thessalonians. There's a restraining force. And the restraining force that right now is on the earth that is holding back unlimited evil is the spirit-filled church of the living God. Just like this one that's gathering in a worship center on Spring Hill Drive on a Sunday morning, worshiping in spirit and in truth and bringing the culture of the climate of God's kingdom to Hernando County. We are salt and light. Come on, somebody. Your self-portrait is a whole lot higher than what you thought. We're we're not here to redo religious activities. We're not here to sing songs. We're not here to just go through tradition. We're here to be an emissary of the kingdom of light in a world of darkness because we are ambassadors and we're transforming the territory for the kingdom's sake. And you need to lift your head up high and realize you have more strength, you have more anointing, you have more wisdom inside of you than what you could ever possibly consider. The devil wants you to think you're no good. You're not going to accomplish anything. Pastor Omar, the devil wants the church to think nobody's getting saved. Those kids, those rotten kids, they were just terrible, those kids over there at that high school. Oh, they just drive me crazy. That's, that's what the devil wants people to believe. The devil doesn't want them to see them on their knees on the 50-yard line with their hands held up high and tears running down their face. The devil doesn't want them to see laying hands on their principal and seeing her speak in tongues in the power of the Holy Ghost and getting filled with the fire of God. I don't know if that's a secret or not, but we just said it. Praise God. Because you're better than you think you are. You're stronger than you, you thought you were because the fire of God and the power of God is inside of you. But when you're gone, this world's going to get in pretty bad shape. And I, for one, am pretty glad I'm not going to be here. Oh, I'll, I'll say that. i I, I got to say that. This season will include what Jesus describes in Matthew 24, 15 as the abomination of desolation. How many have ever heard that? The abomination of desolation. <laughs> it sounds like an epic movie, doesn't it? <laughs> if you're a movie writer and you're looking for a script, name your movie The Abomination of Desolation. Man, it sounds so Hollywoodish. It sounds so dramatic. It sounds, but here's what it really is Matthew 24 15. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, then you need to understand what's happening. The abomination of desolation spoken of and prophesied by Daniel is in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, where it says this, And he, that's Antichrist, he 
shall make a strong covenant with many, this is the nation of Israel, for one week, for one seven, which is for seven years, and for half of that week, for the first, after three and a half years, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Now, that's, that's kind of uh, poetic language. But what it says is Antichrist is going to come. He's going to put a seven-year covenant of peace with Israel. But three and a half years into his covenant, he's going to break his covenant with Israel. And what this scripture says is that he is going to put an end to sacrifice and offering. What does that mean? What that means is that three and one half years into the tribulation, there will be temple sacrifices and there will be offerings that are reinstituted in the temple mountain in the city of Jerusalem. But Antichrist will come and he will put an end to temple sacrifices and he will put an end to the offerings. Now, a lot of people think that the building of the temple and all those sorts of things are requirements before the rapture. There are indications that they are rebuilding the temple. There are things in the news every once in a while. If you listen, that they're making preparations, they're laying plans. The temple mount is going to be completed someday. That dome of the rock, that pagan temple someday is going to get torn down and God's people are going to erect a new temple to the holy God of Israel. But that's not required to happen prior to the rapture. Nothing has to happen prior to the rapture. We don't even have to eat lunch today prior to the rapture. I mean, if I get my choice, I'm going to eat in my heavenly reward. Come on, somebody. Of course, if the rapture doesn't take place, then I'm still going to have lunch. But if the rapture does take place, then I'll skip lunch and I'll just be in heaven for all eternity. But people make up things. Well, the rapture can't take place yet because the temple's not rebuilt and they haven't reinstituted temple sacrifices. Well, no, what it says is that these temple sacrifices are going to be cut off and they have to be started before they can be stopped. But they don't have to be stopped until three and a half years in. See, it would be very easy for the rapture to take place today in an 18 months or less. They could have the temple rebuilt in Jerusalem. And they could have sacrifices being offered. And Antichrist will most likely come on the scene and help Israel in that process. He will deceive them. He will probably help them raise money. He will probably facilitate that. The whole world will say, wow, this guy is solving all of our problems. There's no more world conflict. He is bringing healing between the Jews and the Muslims. He is bringing healing between the races. Oh, isn't he such a wonderful, wonderful person? We're all going to follow him. But three and a half years in, he's going to break his covenant. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to do that violently and aggressively. The Bible says this in 2 Thessalonians 2. He opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. He will come on the scene. He will stop temple sacrifices. He will do that very violently, very aggressively, because not only is he the antichrist, he's the instead of Christ. Not only is he against people worshiping the one true God, he's against people worshiping any God, because he wants all poor people to worship him as God. And he will set himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And it could very well be that he will duplicate what was done in 167 B.C. by Antiochus Epiphanes. During the intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, this um, um, loot, brutal uh, ruler, he breached the temple in Jerusalem and he erected an altar to Zeus on top of the sacred altar of burnt offering in the Jewish temple and he sacrificed a pig on the altar of Zeus to that pagan god. And it could very well be, a lot of scholars think Antichrist will follow that example. He will tear down the temple sacrifices, offering worship to God in anticipation of the lamb, which we know is as Jesus. But he'll tear that down and he'll set himself up on a pagan altar and cause everybody to worship him as God. And when he does that, Israel is going to say, 
<laughs> this ain't who we thought it was. He's not the Savior. He's not the Christ. He's an Antichrist. He's not the God. He's an anti-God. He's not our hero. He is our enemy. And when that covenant is broken, literally all hell will break loose on the planet for the nation of Israel. They will flee. People that are Israeli in origin during this time will be public enemy number one, and they will have to flee for their very lives. That's why Jesus said, Matthew 24, 16, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are on the housetop not go down to take what's in the house. In other words, when this persecution is released instantaneously after the breaking of the covenant of Antichrist, if you've got something in your house that you forgot, don't even go back and get it. You don't have time. You've got to run for your life. Let the one who is in the field not turn back to get his coat. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, it'll be so terrible to flee. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such has not been from the beginning of the world until now. And no, there will never be this kind of tribulation again. I'll tell you what some other time about how God is going to supernaturally protect his people and how God will give them safety and uh, protection from this Antichrist. But he will be out to control the whole world with a rod of iron and with an iron fist and set himself up and demand that everybody worship him and serve him as God. He's given permission. Where do I say permission? Where's God? I'll tell you exactly where God is. God's sitting back saying, the script is playing out exactly like I've written it. I'm still orchestrating the circumstances of human events and everything's right on schedule because all of this is going to turn to Israel recognizing he was not Christ and they'll turn and understand who really was the Christ and turn to Jesus and thousands upon thousands of thousands and millions of Jews in this season will be saved believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, confessing him as their savior by the blood of Jesus. There's only one way to get saved. I said this last week, I think. God's not going to go in that day and say, okay, all the Israelites are just automatically get, get grafted in because th here's a, a, a plan B. No, there's only plan A. There is no remission for sins without the shedding of blood. And plan A will be rebrought to the attentions of the people of Israel and they will confess their sin. They will look upon the one they pierced and they will confess Jesus as their Savior. But this will be a horrible, horrible time. That's why it says even the elect could not survive in those days if those days weren't cut short. Horrible devastation. And I can't teach on this with great certainty this morning, but some scholars suggest this season of war may include what's prophesied in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. And this is the war prophesied by the prophet Ezekiel. Anybody familiar with Ezekiel 38 and 39? You probably are. I'll give you just a simplistic picture of it. This is prophesied in the Bible. How many know God's the only one that can write history ahead of time? And we call it Bible prophecy. And so God, through a prophet by the name of Ezekiel, hundreds of years before the coming of Jesus gives a prediction that Russia, the great Russian bear to the north. Every time you hear geographical designations in the Bible, they're always in reference to the nation of Israel. When it says the Russian bear is going to come down from the north, it's not from the north of the United States. It's not from the north of Australia. It's not from the north of New Zealand. It's from the north of Israel. And if you look on your map straight north of Israel, you go up and there is that whole vast area called Russia. And what Ezekiel 38 and 39 predict is that Russia, along with an amalgamation of nations, will invade Israel to come to take control of the vast oil and natural resources that are in the nation of Israel. Ezekiel chapter 38 says, I prophesy against Gog and Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. You probably heard this. And these are all ancient names and references to Russian cities and Russian rulers. And then it says in Ezekiel 38 verse 8, 
I think I have this on the screen. And many days, after many days, you will be mustered. In the latter years, you will go. This is God prophesying that Russia will go against the land that is restored from war. The land whose people were gathered from many peoples. What's the people whose land was gathered from many peoples? It's obvious the nation of Israel gathered from the whole earth. Upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste, its people were brought out from the peoples, and they now dwell securely, all of them. And Russia, the great northern bear, will come and invade Israel. Now, there's a bit of other nations that decide to be a part of that. Who will support Russia? This is in verses 4, 5, and 6. And I will turn you about and put hooks in your jaws, and I will bring you out. You and all your army, horsemen and, and, and horsemen and all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, yielding swords. And here's the amalgamation of nations that will work with Russia. Persia, the old Persian empire. Do we know who that is? Iraq and Iran. Cush. That's an African nation, the nation of Ethiopia, possibly the whole continent of Africa. And put, what is put? Put is ancient word for modern Libya. Anybody ever heard of a place called Benghazi? All of these places are gathering with Russia. And then verse 6, Gomer and all his hordes. Gomer is another spelling, another rendering of Gomer or Gomeria or, or Gomerland, which is, which is Germany. And lastly, it says Beth Togarma, which is actually modern Turkey. All of these nations will join together their forces and they will invade Israel. I don't know when this is going to happen, but some scholars suggest it's in this season of wars and rumors of war right after Antichrist comes on the scene and the second seal is open and the second horseman is on the red horse, which is war brought upon the earth. Well, is there going to be anybody that defends Israel? Is there going to be anybody that comes to Israel defends their will? Verse 13, Sheba and Dedan and all the merchants of Tarshish and all its leaders will defend them. They will say, have you come to seize the spoil? Have you assembled your hosts to carry off plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock, goods, and to seize great spoil? Sheba and Dedan is Saudi Arabia. The mer merchants of Tarshish, that, it, it's not, I get those confused. It's not Tarsus. Paul was from Tarsus. This is a different word. This is the word Tarshish. And what does this word mean? It word means the land that is farthest from Israel. And this would have been written in the day of the Bible. So this is another little Bible eschatology, not eschatology, uh, uh, hermeneutic principle for you. Interpret the Bible in the principles that it was written to, to the people. So when God said, what is the land farthest from Israel? They didn't know there was a Western Hemisphere. They didn't know there was America. They didn't know there was a whole other side of the world. They knew that the land farthest from Israel was the land of Britain, the land of, of England, the land of Great Britain. And it says the merchants of, of Tarshish. And, and Tarshish, at, at the uh, Great Britain has always been known as merchant marines. It's always been known for its nation and its ability to control the waves and the seas. And so he says, they will come to the defense of Israel. And then another place mentions the young lions, which are references to colonies and cultures and, and the countries that are established under Britain's influence. So here's what I say. It's not a very positive thing, but it's a truth. You have to look with a microscope to find the United States in the end time Bible prophecy. Because the United States is no longer a big major player as a national world power. Some scholars say we're not there at all. Other scholars say we're kind of hidden in that seam of that scripture that says the young lions that are those that were brought into being as colonies from Britain, Britannia, and it says that we will, but we, we have to look with a microscope to find America. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but that's not really a good news for me. Because when I was a little guy, I always believed nobody could whip my big brother and nobody could defeat my country. 
Because we were a proud nation. And we were proud of our military. And our military did good things for the rest of the peoples all over the world. I'm going to tell you what right now. There's, there's a lot of confusion in all that right now. And a lot of the scholars, they don't paint a rosy picture for America's future in world domination. America tragically may very well fade to the backgrounds. I, I know this is tragic. And for all you guys that fought for our country and for all of our veterans, it, it's got to be the heartbreak to know that your life and your soul that you gave for our country and all those years of service are not being honored any longer. And it's not being celebrated as a country that wants to bring good to the world. I've I got to get off of this in a minute. I'm just kind of talking to you. I don't want to get myself in trouble here. But everybody kind of relating to what I'm talking about here? Because America, tragically, is not the savior of the world. Never was. But certainly isn't going to be in the last days. All we can do is pray that the church in America can stay strong. I said this in the first service. I'll go ahead and say it in this way. I guess it was a, what, a, a, a movie or a, like a, 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 a Hollywood drama, the best of both worlds. We're living in a day where, where we've got the best of both worlds. We've got, um, how's that? I'll phrase it. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little tired. But, yeah, thank you, sweetheart. It was the best of times. That's, that's the opening line of a famous it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Opening line of a Hollywood uh, play. That's the way it is today. It's the best of times. It's the worst of times. It's the worst of times right now. I don't mean to be a, a, a negative Nancy right now. But I'll tell you what. You watch the news. You get depressed. Because there's people making decisions for the destiny of our country that don't know up from down. They don't know in from out. They, they don't know. They don't have a single solitary clue. And they're making decisions that are going to determine the destiny of our country for generations to come. It's the worst of times politically. It's the worst of times militarily. It is embarrassing in one respect. But it's still the best of times. Because God said in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your young men will dream dreams and your old men will see visions and I'll pour out my spirit on the handmaidens and there'll be revivals in the streets there'll be revivals in the high school there'll be revivals in churches that give room for the Holy Spirit to move and people will still be filled with the power and the spirit of God and we can make a difference not for our military strength or our political clout as an American but by the fact that we're strong in the Lord in the power is my when we we go to our knees we have the authority and the anointing to shift nations by the word of our faith and the prayer of our spirit so these nations will defend Israel I gotta hurry here I'll wrap this up why will these nations including Russia attack Israel well number one because they hate Israel evil demonic anti-semitism still there but ultimately, they want the spoils of the land. Ezekiel 38, 13. You can see it on the screen. Because the land of Israel is the richest land in the earth. The minerals alone along the valley of the Dead Sea are worth trillions of dollars. That's a T. Turn to your neighbor and... <laughs> not millions, not billions, but trillions. A trillion dollars is incomprehensible. A million dollars is incomprehensible for most of us. <laughs> but if a million dollars is incomprehensible, a billion dollars is incomprehensible, and a trillion dollars is unfathomable. And yet the wealth of Israel, their natural resources are worth trillions of dollars. And I'm going to close with this. Pastor Meredith helped me here. My Bible mentor, Dr. George Westlake, I've talked to you about him many times in Kansas City, did a sermon over 50 years ago, over 50 years ago. I heard him do this sermon over 30 years ago, and when he did this sermon 30 years ago, he had already been preaching it for 20 years. 50 years ago, he did a message called, The Name of the Game is Oil. 
and he outlined kind of what I just explained to you this morning, how that Russia will come down to invade the spoils of the Middle East, and they'll go for the oil, because our world runs today on the gold standard, I mean on the oil standard. We think it's the gold standard. We don't operate on the gold standard. We operate on the oil standard. Because oil is the economic driving thing that controls the economies of the world. And Pastor Westlake preached his sermon. And he had a deacon come up to him when he got finished. You praying, Miss Naomi? You just got to love them. Deacons I'm talking about. This deacon came up to him and choked his finger in the face of Pastor Westlake. And he said, oh, Pastor, oil will never be that important. Your sermon, I don't agree with it. You're preaching false doctrine because oil will never be that important in the earth. And Pastor Westlake said, I just looked at him in his double knit polyester suit. How many have those? You remember those <laughs> stretchy polyester double knit suits? What are they made out of? Oil. And he probably just got finished having his fried chicken with a plastic fork made out of oil. And he's getting ready to go out and get in his, this would have been in the 70s, get in his muscle car that got less than 10 miles a gallon because oil was cheap. And this is just me. This is just me having fun. He probably had those stretchy support hose nylon socks pulled up to his kneecaps because he was so old and cranky, his legs were giving out and his veins were showing. And he said, but oil will never be that important in the earth. And Pastor Wagflake says, oh, okay. You can have your opinion. (laughs) Opinions are like belly buttons. Everybody has one and they're worth about what you pay for them. So, you know, if you got an opinion, that's, that's your opinion. But how many know oil is very, very important? It runs the economy of the world. And Russia, I'm not making this up. I'm not like imagining this. This is Bible prophecy that they will invade Israel. But here's the end of it all. Ezekiel 39, verses 3 through 6. I want to just read this. Stand to your feet. I want to just read this. Throw me that mic right there, if you would, please. I want to just read this. Then I will strike your bow. This is God prophesying to Russia and all of its amalgamation of nations. I will strike your bow from your left hand and make your arrows drop out of your right hand. You shall fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all your hordes and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to the birds of prey of every sort into the beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall in the open field for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. And I will send fire on Magog, that's another rendering of Moscow, and on those who dwell securely in the coastlands and they shall know that I am the Lord. What is the theme? The theme of this whole book is so that the whole earth will know that I am the Lord. Can I tell you that my heart's beat this morning for the theme of the book of Revelation? It's not so that we learn stuff. It's not so that we come up here and we learn all these details of the great tribulation of the trumpets and the bowls and the vials. And Pastor Omar quoted this verse already this morning because the Bible says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You know what Revelation is all about? This whole book of Revelation is about Jesus Christ in Him crucified, high and lifted up. The old timers used to say, say I've already read the back of the book and we win and that's the theme of the whole book of Revelation that all the peoples on the earth will know that there is a God in Israel and he is powerful mighty awesome sovereign most worthy God and he's able to save and deliver and heal to the uttermost that's the message of it all say pastor I never could understand the revelation I just explained it to you the whole book what's the theme Jesus wins That's all you need to know. Jesus wins. So you know what that means? You need to get on the right team. (laughs) Because Jesus wins. I got to close. 
If you're not in right relationship with Jesus today, ask him to be the Lord of your life. Ask him to come into your heart. Forgive and forget every sin you've ever committed because he's coming back one of these days. I'm telling you, he is. And all the earth will see him. And even those who pierced him, all the kindreds of the earth will mourn because of him. But you can acknowledge him today as Savior and Lord. So with every bed bowed, and every eye closed this morning, before we close, I want to ask you today, is everything right today between you and Jesus? Is there any unconfessed sin? Is there anything that needs to be fixed? Any repentance that needs to take place? Because we've got to be ready when he comes. We've got to be like the virgins that kept our lamps trimmed and our wicks burning full of the oil because we were waiting up for the coming of the Lord. Not the foolish virgins that fell asleep. And when they heard in the midnight cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. They were not ready. They had not been diligent in their preparations. So, Father God, today, I just ask that you move upon the hearts of anyone in this room that needs to give their life to Christ, need to ask Jesus to be their Savior and their Lord, that they do so because today is the day of salvation. Is that you this morning? Anyone at all, you lift your hand real quick before we close in prayer, before we leave today. Pastor Coates, I need to get right with God today. I'm away from Jesus. I need to give my life to Christ. This stuff about the coming of the Lord and the end of the world and the end times and all that stuff, it, it scares me. Good. I want you to make the right preparations so that you can be in eternity forever with Jesus, absent from the body present with the Lord. And you can join with the hosts of those around the throne and the four and the twenty elders that just have one word on their hearts. Captivated, consumed, infatuated with what they see and what they hear. And it's holy, 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 holy is the Lord. We're going to go in just a minute. Oh, what a song of worship this morning. What an anthem of honor to the holiness of our God this morning. You are holy. If you need to go, I understand this morning. If you have appointments, responsibilities you need to attend to, we understand. But if you're not in a hurry this morning, you'd just like to kind of bask in the presence of Jesus for a little while, just go ahead and move towards the front. Just come on, go ahead and come up on this altar area. Let's just kind of honor Jesus a little bit with our worship this morning. You're holy, holy, holy. Thank you, Lord.
Praise the Lord God Almighty. There is no one like you. You are holy, holy. Praise the Lord. I want to bless you today as you go. Just walk in God's power and anointing on your life. If anyone needs special prayer, we're always here at the close of the service. Not only myself, but other members of our staff and our team. We're here to pray with you, anoint you, anything that you need to desire today. So God bless you. We love you very, very much. Have an awesome day.